Welcome students, this is Eric Magidson. This is CIS 244, Systems Analysis and Design, Chapter 8, User Interface Design. So we're into phase three of the systems design process. We're ready to put the rubber to the road and actually develop the system. So we've gone through, we've got our requirements, we've got our business processes, We've done all that front end work, that 80% that should lead to the 20% of actually designing the physical system and putting it in play for value for our customers. So here we go. Uh, you know, nice little cartoon here. You know, you haven't yet heard the, what the problem is yet. Uh, how can you recommend building a database to solve it? And of course, the computer nerd says, we always build a database and we'll need coffee mugs for the project team. <laughs> The problem is that we have poor processes. That could be a slogan on our coffee mugs. So, you know, here's the thing. We, in my professional career, I've run into this a lot where as we go through the design process and, you know, figure out what the system needs to do, what its requirements are, what the business rules are. I've said this before in lectures. This is a great opportunity to improve the business process because if we don't, um, we're putting garbage in and getting faster, more productive, I use that term loosely, garbage out. So if we start by improving the business processes, we're going to be in a lot better shape. So let's take a look at that. From a user interface design, I'm sure that most of you have probably on your smartphone, that's where we tend to download the most software we use today. You've downloaded a piece of software, even though it's free, you look at it and you go, you know, I'm just going to pull this off my phone. It's clunky. It's hard to use. It's not intuitive. There's not a design to the software. So that's something that we need to look at. So here, you know, systems design, uh, we're in the third of five phases in the system development life cycle. You know, we'll work with the physical design. So we'll take all that logical rules that we came up with, the decision trees, all that good stuff and we'll apply it to the system. So again, we're getting into that 20%. If we spent 80% at the beginning coming up with our design, coming up with our rules, knowing down to the functional primitives, you know, in our DFD diagrams, everybody's agreed, yep, that's what the system needs to do. Let's go ahead and build it. Well, we start with the user interface. So physical design again, task will include user interface design data design, and system architecture. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Deliverable is the system design specification. So that's where we are. Um, go ahead and look at these chapter objectives. Pause if you'd like. We're going to go through them as we go through this lecture. More of the objectives. So go ahead and pause and take a peek. And now into the actual design phase. So Goal of a systems design is to build a system that is effective, reliable, and maintainable. So we need to look at, are we building a system that we're go that first of all is effective? Is the user interface following that business process? You know, are we putting forms together where the information on maybe a written form is all together on one page, for example? You know, simple example, but but you know, very true to heart that that we need to create things that are going to work for the end user. Who's putting the data in the system? Who's looking at the data coming out of the system? Is it how they expect it to be? Is it going to be effective on a daily basis for them? Is the system reliable? You know, can it handle the number of inputs? Can, what does it do with input errors? A lot of times, you know, as we start system design, folks will start designing spreadsheets in Excel. Um, that don't have error handling. And we have the ability even in Excel to do that, to say, okay, what do we do if someone puts in greater than 40 and we can only have zero to 40, say for regular hours that they put in? You know, we need to be able to handle those input errors. Are they putting in data consistently? Do we have drop boxes? You know, if they can only pick true or false or yes and no, or, you know, male and female, uh, for example, do we have that data entry exactly as we expect it to be, not an open form where somebody might accidentally put in M-A-I-L when we need lowercase M-A-L-E, for example. So, you know, uh, processing errors, what happens if the data is not all complete? 
How does the end user get notified that they need to put in more information for us to process it or that they put in the wrong information, thus it can't be processed? What do we do with hardware failure? Is this a system that needs to be, say, on a clustered server environment where we have that redundancy at the hardware level so that if the system fails, it fails over to other hardware and the system keeps running? Imagine if, say, a hospital or even a doctor's office built a system without that redundancy. Could they treat patients effectively um, you know, and safely, matter of fact, with how much data we're storing? They most likely aren't going to have a paper chart. They can go back and even find out who is allergic to what, for example. How do we handle human mistakes? Is it maintainable, flexible, scalable, and easily modified? So remember, the majority of the code in a system is the majority of the coding is done after the system is in place with modifications, with upgrades, with etc. So we need to start with good code that is able to be modified. So will it succeed? So you know, think like a user. I'm sure you all can think of examples where you've Im implemented or you've interacted with software that was clearly done by a computer nerd that wasn't thinking like a user, but was thinking like an engineer. You know, well, this makes it easy for us to change or easy for us to do this. It makes a simple interface, but it may not be the interface that a user will find. For example, it says right there, easy to learn, you know, easy to follow, intuitive, forgiving of errors. Now, when we talk about forgiving of errors, what we mean is, do we give an error back to the user that is easily understood for how maybe we need the data entered um, so that they can learn that process. Does it pop up each time? Uh, does an error pop up each time? Or is this system intuitive that the, as the user starts learning the system, we don't have all these pop-ups to define things that the user needs because they already know what they need. They're already putting in the data correctly. So pre-designed output should be attractive, easy to understand with an appropriate level of detail. Give the user an output of only what the user needs to do their job, right? Systems or information overload, you know, great example of that. Open up your email. You know, if you've had an email account for a while and it doesn't have a good intuitive spam filter, you get a bunch of stuff that you don't necessarily need that you have to sort through to get the information you need. We certainly don't need to spam our users with data from their own system. So anticipate future needs, you know, what's the expansion going to be, um, provide flexibility. We, let me simplify this for a minute and say, it's just like buying a computer. We may get a new user who's buying a computer and we don't need to look at just what the user intends to do with it now, but what the user intends to do with it two or three years from now, maybe they're gonna get into video um, or photo editing and stuff like that, where they're going to need more resources. We want to give the user a system that is going to work today and is going to work as their business grows over the next five years. So we don't want to be putting in a system just because it works today and not think about what our needs are tomorrow, a year from now, two years from now. During whatever we choose or whatever we've determined, the life cycle of that system is going to be. So start with the default value that displays automatically. Yeah, because if that's the value that's put in 75% of the time, then the user doesn't have to put it in. They can just tab through that and say, yep, that's the data that I'm going to put in. So we need to manage data effectively. So the system should enter and verify data as soon as possible. So again, uh, if we're entering in a new customer, there should be a check to make sure someone hasn't put in that customer information before so that we don't have redundant customers, for example. Each data item should have a specific type, alphabet, you know, alphabetic, numera, uh, numeric, or alphanumeric, uh, for example, and a range of acceptable values. So in the case of regular hours, we know it's gonna be a numeric value um, and it's going to be zero to 40 for regular hours, or we might have something where we're allowing the person just to put in the total number of hours and we separate it from regular hours to overtime hours. Maybe we do that work. But let's say it's out of a typical range. Let's say it's you know 55 hours. We might want to pop up and say, hey, this is out of the normal range. Normally we see you know overtime in the 
you know, uh, 41 to 46 hours. Is this correct? Just to make sure they didn't fat finger the data and make a mistake that's going to cost us to either overpay or maybe underpay um, an employee. So that, of course, would create more work on the back end where if we just had a value that was, um, you know, that was checked for an acceptable range, we're going to save a lot of work. So collect input data as close to its source as possible. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's not just because we don't want to put in the data, but one of the reasons why customers tend to put in their own customer data um, because they're at the closest level to the customer. They are the customer. They know what the data is. Okay. So uh, users can design their own output. So some systems are intuitive enough that users can go in and, you know, use a reporting tool to drag and drop what they need, where they need it, filter it, sort it, you know, examine the data um, so that they can create their own reports. They don't necessarily have to come back to IT. You know, some IT departments, you know, no longer produce reams of printed reports. Um, there's no reason for it. We can do a report that's dynamic. You can run it now. You can run it 10 minutes from now. If the data would change, that may be a requirement of the system is that we run this each hour. We see where we are in production for that day. You know, overwhelming trend has been to, um, to customer designed output. So think about that internally. Each customer, even in the same department, may need a specific output to do their job successfully. So we want a system that's going to allow them to do that. And as you work on your personal trainer case, which you should be heavily into after last week, you'll find that a lot of these systems say they offer this. We want to make sure and go in and see, is this really something that a general end user can produce? Or is IT really going to have to be involved we might have to be involved to produce the report that each user needs, but once it's produced, maybe the end user can go in and modify, drag, drop, and make changes to the report as their job changes or as the data that they get changes. They can go, oh, well, you know, if I could get this data, that would help me even more. So they drag and drop it onto a report, for example. So, and again, information overload, we have to be really careful of that. So. A UI or user interface describes how users interact with a computer system and consists of all the hardware, software, screens, menus, functions, everything that the system does. So a great example of this is let's just look at Microsoft Windows and how the user interface has changed. You know, they went away from that standard start menu that we all got so used to. We knew where to find things, you know, and they went to that, you know, to that welcome screen, for example, where all of your um, all of your icons, all of your programs showed up. Well, that was annoying. What happened? Microsoft went back and users said, no, nah, we want that start screen back. Give us back the start screen. Give us the easy menu where we can find things. So they kind of did a happy medium where we have the start button back and it has some functionality we're used to and some of the new functionality that Microsoft feels will better or create a better user environment in the future once users learn to use it. The challenge is giving users time to learn to use it. Who's going to train them, right? It's the same thing with this system. So, you know, output two-way communications between the user and the computer. That's what is important. It needs to be inviting. Okay. So you can read through this, you know, all the jargony terms of what a user interface is according to IBM, you know, like any good communication channel, a user interface is a two-way street. You don't want to just see or hear whatever the computer puts in front of you. You want to be able to interact with it. You want to be able to make changes. Some systems go as far as to customize. So I'll give you an example of that. COCC is currently looking at some new digital catalog software. And some of them even go as far as to allow you, the student, to customize what the catalog looks like for you. Um, what information you constantly go to. It starts creating a history and it starts customizing a catalog per individual student. So that's kind of interesting. You don't have to go through and search through all the garbage of chemistry if you're, you know, say a business major, for example. 
you can just get right to the business major section. You can start customizing, well, looking at this degree compared to this degree compared to this degree. As you take classes and your interest may change, um, it, it would give you the information that you want. So if that makes sense. So human computer interaction, HCI describes the relationship between computers and people who use them to perform their jobs or to perform functions. I mean, just look at the, the modern car today and look at what's available in a modern car and how we interact with the car to, you know, automate maps or get where we want to go or change the station without you know, messing with the buttons, we just click and voice activation, you know, change to 102.9 FM, you know, changing to 102.9 FM, you know, keeping our hands on the steering wheel or focus on the primary job function when driving a car, which is driving a car, be safe, stay out of people's way, um, being able to react, um, you know, to stimulus as things happen in our environment of driving the car. So, the you know, main objective is to create a user-friendly design that is easy to learn and use. I think a great example of that is Office. You know, Microsoft has worked over the decades to create a better user interface, to put the things that users use most, you know, on that home tab. Um, you know, that's where the majority of functionality is. So you kind of figure that out, you know. Simplicity uh, is, is really key, you know. So... Have you ever watched, uh, wanted to talk to someone behind the technology we all use? Well, now, you know, now's your chance, da, 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 the you in user interface, blah, blah, blah. So a little marketing stuff. But it is the idea of <laughs> being able to, we can now go out and communicate with companies that are designing software and say, you know, this is how I use it or this is what I think and then they can take that information out to the masses and say, well, if we made this change, would it better your user experience? You know, look at how simplistic YouTube is to use and to operate. And, you know, the idea of, oh, gee, I want to embed this video on my site. Well, you know, if the company allows that, they have a link that says embed, you know, and suddenly you embed that, that video into your site. And maybe as things change, that video changes based on what the company has put out. So... Kind of interesting there. Understand the business. I'm not sure how you design a system without understanding the business and the business needs and the business goals, you know, whether it be a department or the entire enterprise. We need to understand what the business does, how it does it, where it does it, why it does it, and for whom it does it. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. We've got to understand all that stuff so that we can implement a system that works for the business and works for the customers, the internal customers that are going to either enter data into the system and or get data out of the system. That's why we do this, right? So we maximize uh, graphical effectiveness. You know, studies show how people learn better visually. Of course they do. Um, you all will watch videos like this uh, more than read your textbook, for an example. It's just proven. So. Think like a user, see the system through the user's eyes. Sometimes that can be um, a challenge to do when you're an IT person. You know, the idea of sitting with the user and saying, okay, why is it that you like this screen this way over this way? Um, sometimes it may mean more programming hours to get it the way the user wants it, but that also means that, the, that it's more inviting to the user and the user's, there's more app, uh, app more possibility that the user is going to actually use the system to do more, to create more, to enter more data. And the more data we have in the system, the better information we get out the back end. So, um, you know, use terms and metaphors that are familiar to the users. So suddenly we need to almost know what the user's job is. How is the user going to interact with the system? What is it each user does? So, we already have that information. We got that in the requirements gathering. Now we're just putting it into effect, creating that physical model of the system. So, you know, user models and prototypes. Yeah, we can go and storyboard things and, you know, go back to the user and say, is this your job function? Because today we can actually create a role. A lot of systems are designed based on, on standard roles um, that a 
across an industry. You know, this is what a, a gym manager does. This is what a gym person at the entryway. This is what a trainer does. This is what the accounting person or a marketing person does in a gym. And then we can actually go in and drag and drop things to customize that user, user interface depending on how many people we have. If we're a large gym, what might be done by one person at a small gym might be done by two or three people in a larger organization. So we can customize based on their specific role. We can design specific roles. So the system needs to be able to do that. Not sure why that went off. That's kind of weird. So opening the screen should be the main menu of options for, again, you know, this is student services. It would be different for instructor services, for example. So depending on the role, we can present a customized interface for each role, each person in the organization. So we, of course, if we design this, we want to bring this back. It's a circular motion that happens. What do you think of this? Well, this would work for me. This would work better. This could do this. OK, you know, let's go ahead and do that um, so that the system, again, is scalable and grows as the business grows. So if suddenly one job becomes two jobs, we want to be able to create a role that that implements correctly the functionality for each job. Again, giving the user just what they need to do their job and just the output they need to successfully complete their job or their daily tasks. So. We want to document everything that we do across the board so that we have an understanding of where we came from and where we're going. Also, the documentation works for programmers. A lot of times when we're doing prototyping, we're doing storyboarding, a programmer can easily implement that stuff based on the documentation that we've created. Okay, so rule one, create a user interface that's easy to learn and use. Well, again, I'd ask you, challenge you, go back, think about the applications that you've downloaded to your phone or to your computer recently, you know, what was good about them? What was bad about them? What was maybe also there's the other side that sometimes we have to demonstrate to a user, yeah, you're used to doing it that way, but let me show you why this works better. You know, maybe it works better for the majority of users. So some people are going to have to change and, and change is certainly a, con, uh, a constant when we talk about technology and software and et cetera, because as the technology changes, everything changes. We see that, um, you know, like for example, one of the main reasons why Windows has designed, redesigned their operating system the way they have is they're trying to get a consistent user interface, a consistent experience across your, your smartphone, your tablet, um, your smart book or just your regular notebook or even your desktop computer where you know think about just the changes that need to happen when we added the ability for touch screen for example in an interface so you know things had to get a little bit bigger so your fat thumb could could touch an area that was large enough to get you where you wanted to go so allow users to correct errors easily you know Clearly label all controls and buttons and icons. Yeah, you don't want something sitting out there that people don't know what the heck it does. So enhance user productivity. Of course, that's why we're building the system. So organize tasks, commands, functions, and groups that resemble actual business operations or processes. So, you know, when it's something like uh, enter customer payment, well, we, we might have a button that's enter customer payment and it takes the user through each business process that needs to be done to successfully enter a customer payment, for example. You know, create al uh, alphabetical menu lists, yes. You know, provide shortcuts for experienced users so they can avoid multiple menu levels. This again is that idea of when they become interactive, maybe we turn off the hints or the smart screens or the things, but actually working in the system might be a way to train users how to use the system and once they become proficient at it we can turn off certain levels of, of functionality that would help a, a, a non-educated user to maintain or or to navigate the system use default values again i encourage you to pause and read all of these you know provide a fast find feature yeah there's a lot of great things we can do get a user right where they want to go or maybe even as the user uses it you know, go ahead and create a menu based on, well, this is the task you do the most. 
you know, we've noticed as you've used the system, this is what you use the most. So for this individual user who logs in, we're going to put register students at the top, but maybe print grade reports. Another user does that the most. So we would put these in an order. Um, I'm just using, you know, help topics or, you know, it could be help topics or it could be functions that they do in the system. So. You know, require user confirmation before data deletion, you bet. You know, we see this in Microsoft. Are you sure you want to delete this? Are you sure you're sure you want to do this? They do that so that you don't accidentally delete something. Um, you know, I find this interesting with Apple. They make deleting a, a, a application pretty easy. You click on it, you, you know, you drag it over um, to the garbage and you're done. You know, but the question is, well, is it really gone? No, because they use the thing, oh, a user made a mistake, let me take it out of the garbage, right? Um, whereas with Microsoft, you're really deleting something after you go to the control panel and say, uninstall this software, and Microsoft says, are you sure? Yep. Well, we asked you if you were sure. You said, yes, we uninstalled the software. So, um, you know, more on rule three, users um, with help and feedback. You see this, you know, much better... Um, pop-up windows now with better information on where to go if you you know are putting in data incorrectly you know the idea of you know cryptic user feedback you know I, I like the one you're putting in a phone number right and they want dashes instead of parentheses or or now most people you put in your phone number without any dashes without any parentheses and they format it back in the database the way they want it to come out on reports or or on um, screens that that are produced to give the information or data back to another user but let's say you put in parentheses and they they just have a error that says wrong format well what format do you want wrong format try to get wrong format oh that's so annoying just tell me give me an example in the error you know we're looking for this format oh I can put it in and matter of fact put that format in a text above the entry text box so I know exactly how you want it put in. So create an attractive layout and design. You know, use appropriate colors to highlight different areas of the screen. Again, um, we might go with a color scheme for a business process. So back to our enter customer payment. You know, that might be blue, and and all the screens are blue, and this and that and the other. So you know, you get used to seeing that color. You get used to seeing hyperlinks a certain way you get consistency among the system. So whether you're entering a payment or you're billing a customer or you're looking at a customer history, that consistency plays through in the system. It keeps it clean. It's a well-designed system. Um, people know where they are and what they're doing at all times within the system. So use consistent terminology. Yep, you know, consistent to who? Not consistent to the designer, consistent to the end user. Okay, you know, things like, you know, remember that users get accustomed to patterns, red, stop or bad, yellow, caution, green, go. We see this in spreadsheets as well. You know, uh, calculation, if it's in the negative, you know, it's, it's red. If it's in the yellow or close to some limit, um, if it's a good number, it's in green, you know, so we create reports from our data. You know, uh, provide keystroke alternative for each menu command. So a lot of times people will design for people to use a mouse or people to use a touch screen when other people, um, it's easier for them to use a keyboard, to use keyboard shortcuts. So we see this a lot in Microsoft Office where there's five different ways to perform a single function. Go up and click here, or go here and here and here and click here because that's intuitive for some thinkers. Use the keyboard, you know, control C to copy, control V to paste. Why not control P? Because in old systems, people got used to control P being print. So control P is print, and there we are. So again, there's a lot of user design that, you know, sort of, not sort of, there's a lot of user design that is now consistent across all systems. So user design from the operating system level that we implement into our software so that our software looks the same as the operating system. It looks the same as Office. People get used to using Office, so they get used to seeing those same icons, for example. And we want to use similar icons in our software so that people don't have to look around for, say, the save button. We know that's a disk of some sort, so we use a disk, and they know that's the save 
um, icon and they can click on that and move forward with whatever they're doing. So, you know, they're really showing some simplified user interfaces here. Keep in mind, sometimes simple is better. We don't need to spend a bunch of time creating fancy interfaces that do fancy things when sometimes the KISS method, keep it simple, silly, or there's another word for that, um, really applies here. So enhance the command button to initiate an action, such as printing a form or you know requesting help. Um, pretty simple to just you know put the text on the button, print help. Users should know what that means. Um, using a software package, check to see if it allows you to create customized menu and bars. So as you go through looking for that best system for personal trainer, keep in mind: is it modifiable? Is it modifiable by you, the company that's going to use it? Or do we have to go back and pay extra to have the company modify things that better suit our business processes? Or sometimes we have to consider, is it easier and co more cost effective to change our business process, whatever physical business process that it is, so that it matches the logical process that the system's already been designed? You know, when we create a system from scratch, we get to match our business process, whether that's good or bad. When we're buying a system off the shelf or a software as a service, we're going to have to think and be considerate and be accepting that we're going to have to change our business process to manage, to work with the system, for example. So keep that in mind as well. You might find companies that, that are just so set in their business processes. This works. We've been doing this for years that you're going to spend more time and more money designing a system that's going to work for that unique business. So more on enhancing the user interface, you know, so check boxes. Today we see things like, um, you know, we'll see a little calendar icon next to a date and we click on that and we choose the date from the calendar. That keeps us from having to know what format we need to put it in. You know, this is a great example where maybe in a user, like a training mode, we might have a red area up here that shows the format that we want the social security number put in, that we want the date dashes put in, or that we don't want the dashes put in. Here, that we want capitalization you know, on things. Maybe our system doesn't automatically capitalize as people put in the data, or maybe it does, in which case we can accept it either capital or not capital, and we do a check on that. That's more programming, but if you think about it, we make sure the data going into our database is consistent in the way it's formatted. Okay, so city, you know, if we're in Central Oregon and, and we deal the majority of the time with Bend, Bend might be the default that we put in here. And there might be a down arrow where they can pick, up, you know, different ones. And then the last one is other. And maybe they have the ability then to manually enter a new city that is not in the system. Once they enter the new city, Maybe somebody, you know, maybe an area becomes a city. Um, once they put in the city, it might say, hey, do you want to put the, this in the master record so it comes in the pull down next time? Yes, I do. You know, well, that's going to take a manager to put that in. So please have a manager, you know, log in and do that, for example. So focus on data entry screens. You know, everything is clear. It needs to follow the format maybe of a form. It might follow the format, the logical format of what data we put in, in what order we tend to put it in, um, in the order that it's coming off of a form, or maybe even the order that it's been entered into our website is how we put it in the back end system, for example. So you can see here, you know, here's a great example. You know, we put in an item, we click here. We put in a new item, we put in a new item, it continues to add up the sales price and the tax and et cetera, you know, as we do this for a customer. Or maybe this is a customer facing interface where they're putting in the items that they want to order. So focus on data entry screens, you know, just go out to Amazon, start searching around, shopping for items. You'll see how good this process can be. So rule six, focus on data entry screens, you know, provide more on that, provide a means for users to move among the fields. If they don't have the data at this time, where is it saved? Maybe they want to put it in or they put it in, they give the customer the, you know, the grand total and the customer says, yeah, I need to think about that. 
All right, well, is there a holding place where I can say, you know what, we're going to save this order for you for 72 hours. When you call back, just let them know that you've already, you know, you have a pre-order in place so that we don't have to enter all this data again, right? They just call back in and they say, oh yeah, I want to order this, 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 and this, but leave this off. Okay, click off. Here's the new total. Are you ready to order? Yes. Click a button and off it goes. But again, we want to also have rules that say, well, this is one of those 72-hour holds on an order. After 72 hours, it disappears. So maybe what happens is after 24 hours of things being in a user's shopping cart, we send an email. You know, just a reminder, hey, you put stuff in your shopping cart, it's missing you, are you going to buy it? Great marketing opportunities as well. So you can see that, that uh, where sales and marketing can inter interact and link. So we're going to stop right here at slide 27 for this presentation. We'll come back for part two and finish up user design. Take care.